Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one is, where is Jimmy Hoffa's body? Um, the format of the show, if you're new here, one of my writers, in this case Kevin, writes a new script. I've never read it before. And this one I, I really know nothing about. Like, I feel like Jimmy Hoffa is one of those specifically American things. Wasn't he like some, I want to say he was a union guy, but maybe he was a gangster or something like that. Or maybe he was both, you know, unions can get pretty intense. Um, and wasn't he, I, I feel like he was buried in some stadium, right? Didn't some, ah, oh, maybe some gangsters through his body body in like the the foundations of a stadium isn't that what people think this is literally all i know about jimmy hoffa other than him maybe being murdered by gangsters or being a gangster or being a union person all the americans listening you're watching are like what are you talking about simon <laughs> you know nothing jimmy hoffa was a musician i don't know uh, i really don't know anyway that's the format of the show let's jump in maybe we'll learn something together honestly given that like 70 percent 60 percent of you are americans who watch this show apparently uh well, you probably know more about this than me already. You're going to learn more than me, which is nice. Oh, I'm going to learn more than you. Sorry, which is nice. By the way, if you like this channel, sort of like you learn something, it's a little bit relaxed. We have a little drink. Got myself a Pepsi Max. Delicious. If you like this sort of show or this podcast, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you like the video if you're watching on YouTube. Tell a friend. Yes, yes. Let's go. I've held a number of different jobs over the years. And this is your best, Kevin. Your dream job has finally been found. Life goal complete. I love my job. But I've never been a part of a union. Um, have I been a part of a I don't think, I don't know. I, I guess, I don't know how unions even work. So I guess not. But I have had like jobs, like I worked for a big supermarket when I was a kid. But I guess other than that, I've worked for like pretty small businesses, like as a checkout boy, as a phone boy, as a, uh, what else have I done? I never tended bar. Uh, I've washed up in a restaurant, and there have never been jobs where it's like, we're getting on the union's whistle. I'll be like, okay, <laughs> what does this mean for me? But maybe I was at Sainsbury's. It's possible. I don't know. It's possible that, you know, when you join a job, they make you sign all that form, those forms and stuff that you don't read. And um, it's possible I was part of a union via that. I don't know. This isn't interesting. Let's just get on. Jesus. The stores where I worked always happened to be non-union stores, and even when I worked for the post office, we weren't part of any union. Postal workers receive federal benefits, despite not technically being federal employees, so a union usually isn't necessary there. And less than 10% of postal workers are unionized. Kevin, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, I'm lost in your American lingo already. Where am I? Despite, I know federal means like big boy government, right? Like the FBI. And they go across all the states. So, but I don't, look, it doesn't matter, does it? Look, you, you weren't in a union. Brilliant. Despite never being in a union, it's very obvious to me that they're a good thing. The most obvious clue that unions are good for workers is just, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, all I know is that Amazon, like in my mind, in my mind, and my opinion from what I've read, my understanding, Amazon doesn't treat its warehouse workers very well. Like there are always those stories and it's like, Amazon worker can't take a piss, ends up peeing themselves everywhere. Obviously I'm exaggerating. But it's kind of this stuff, right? Someone is possibly listening to this. Can you listen to this at Amazon Warehouse? Like, if you're running around an Amazon Warehouse being a picker, can you listen to podcasts or are they like, No podcast, no joy! Joy only for Bezos, the God King! No, I'm kind of kidding. I, like, I love capitalism. Um... <laughs> There's another show I do and I'm always like, capitalism's fine, just don't be a dick about it, okay? I feel like Amazon works really hard not to have unions, and given that Amazon's got a bit of a rep, for uh, not treating its warehouse workers brilliantly. I'm probably like, they're probably good for workers and they're probably not good for old Jeffy boy. Although he's so rich, does he really care? Apparently the answer's yes. Uh, how you I know they're good just because of how hard stores work at keeping unions out. And my previous job as a butcher, holy <laughs> The first day on the job was spent watching a series of boring, boring training videos that I definitely didn't fall asleep during. The only one of these videos that was entertaining was the anti-union video, a 20 minute animated film that depicted unions as evil charlatans that wanted to steal our wages and offer nothing in return. Companies would spend massive amounts of money to stifle unions. When unions on when union stores on the south shore of Massachusetts went on strike, we were offered pay at time and a half plus free hotel rooms to go and staff those stores. I'd be like, hell yeah. And they'd be like, Simon, you're undermining the unions. It's like, bro, time and a half and a hotel room? Is breakfast included? Because I'm down! The one caveat was that we'd likely be working 12 hours days, but we'd be getting paid for 18 hour days and put up in a, a hotel, so who cares? Yeah, I'd always rather take... When I worked at that Sainsbury's job, oh my god, I'm sorry. I know we're supposed to be talking about Jimmy Hoffa, but Kevin talking about all of this stuff just leads me to... Like, Kevin wants to tell stories. Why can't I tell stories? It's my turn! 
It is, you told me it was my turn. You can talk all that you want hey, to, yell hey, and scream, you're okay, lost. It is my you're turn. You lost the game. It's my turn. Take it. When I worked at that Sainsbury's job, I'd always be like, can I get a 12-hour shift? Can I do 14? Because then it all lumps together as one big chunk of time that you don't really notice is passing. Whereas there was one shift that they sometimes, you know, a split shift is the, is, split shifts are the work of demons. Whoever allowed this, I'd join a union just to not do a split shift. Where I was like, yeah, you got to come in at seven, then you leave at 11, and then you come back at four, and you work to eight. So basically, you're just having a super long lunch break where you can't do anything fun because you know you have to go back to work. Split shifts are the deep, ma like, managers who do that are demons. If you're a manager and you do that, try and work out some other way to do it because it really sucks for the people who have to work them. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> a little bit of a rant there because I hated split shifts. I'm done. I'm not sure why I didn't jump on the opportunity of what would have essentially been a well-paid month-long orgy. What he say? Um, is that a typo, or was there something else going down at those hotels, Kevin? But I really hope I had a damn good reason. But if that is how much the company was willing to pay us to fight the union, how much would we gotten paid if we were on the union side and they won? Exactly. <laughs> I have a vague idea because one of my friends had a union job at UPS when we were in high school. He absolutely loved the job for all the reasons that a lot of people today have a negative view of unions. At a time, I was making the state minimum wage of five dollars and twenty-five cents. My buddy was making eleven dollars thanks to decades of hard work and negotiations from, te from the teamers. Well, why didn't you just go and apply for a job at UPS? Holy sh if someone was like, we'll pay $11 compared to $5.25, I'll be like, yes, please. Like, I remember my job at university. It paid £8.50 £8 an hour. And this was so high. Like, the other jobs that you could get would always pay, like, minimum wage. This was, like, £5, £5.20, something like that. And I had this job paying £8.50. I felt so, like, it was awesome. It wasn't because of unions, though. I think it's just because people thought I sounded nice on the telephone. I'd have to phone up businesses and talk to them about sh and I think, I don't know, people have always been like, you got quite a nice voice, whistle boy. And I think that's why I got paid more. Which was nice, because I wasn't very good at, like, other stuff. <laughs> he also loved to talk about how easy the job was, now lazy everybody got to be. Sorry, I know I'm about to go on another tangent. I'm sorry, I know everyone's already turning off. I'm so sorry, but I just, there's so many things I want to talk about. <laughs> I feel like sometimes I just need a podcast where I got to talk about shit, but then no one would listen because there's no, like, reason to click. Um, although Joe Rogan manages it somehow. People listen to him blather on for hours. Once they say, yeah, UPS, even here, we got UPS in check. And is it UPS? Yeah, it's UPS, there's FedEx, there's DPD, and there's definite quality differences. Like UPS, the guy's, the guy's always happy. He's got a big smile. He rings my bell. Like, ding dong, like on the door. I don't know, he does, rings my bell, makes it sound like, hey, UPS man, you ring my bell. But he's like, the other problem is, like, the, there's another company called DPD, which sucks so f***ing hard. And they're like, they ring you. Like, they'll phone your mobile phone. Like, I'll be recording a video, they'll be like, hi, yeah, you got a delivery, I'm outside. And it's like, you go outside, he's not outside. He's like, around the corner in his van. And then he arrives and he parks down the street, you gotta go down there. And he's like, here's your package, He's not like that, but he just hands it to you and he's like, hi, here you go. And it's like, yo, how much was UPS again? Why can't we all just use UPS? I love UPS. I love FedEx as well. FedEx are kings. Except they have this thing. They don't send me invoices for some reason. Like, I get something through customs <laughs> and they'll never send me a bill. All I'll get is like a month later, I'll get a f demand letter <laughs> being like, you haven't paid us and we're going to sue you. And I'm like, FedEx, if you gave me invoices, I would pay you. <laughs> but all I get is this demands letter after like three months because I haven't paid because I've got a f bill FedEx. Listen to me. Listen to me. But other than that, you're amazing. <laughs> but it is weird getting a threatening letter from you every three months. They even weren't allowed to lift any boxes that weighed over 20 pounds for fear of injury. While at my last job, I was routinely throwing 80 to 100 pound boxes of cow and pig parts around the cooler. I have no idea how much these things weigh. It's like roughly half, right? So that's 40 to 50 kilo. Holy shit, Kevin. You got some muscles, man. I, I was like lifting up something that's 25 kilograms the other day. Like a big bag of salt. You know, you put in a water softener. And I was like, this is really heavy. <laughs> and I felt so weak. 
1955, a third of American workers were in unions. Today, only 10% of us are. There's a lot of different factors that have led to decreased union membership. Everything from globalization of fe to federal employment laws to immigration policy has decreased the necessity and utility of unions. But there's also the matter of public perception. It's a common belief among many Americans that unions used to be good, but they all became greedy and corrupt and went too far. And there is no name more synonymous with greedy, corrupt union leaders that went too far than Jimmy Hoffa. When a man like Hoffa disappeared in 1975, there was no Never any question what happened to him. The questions were who pulled the trigger and where is the body? I'll make a very specific UK union joke. Margaret Thatcher did it. Early life. It's not really. That's the thing. Like I feel like my parents would know a lot about unions. If I asked them about you, or maybe someone who just works a job in the UK, like a regular ass job, would know. I realise I'm a bit out of touch with that because I don't live in the UK and I don't have a job. I mean, like I mean, obviously I work, but I don't have like a job. I don't work for someone else. It's not really a surprise that Jimmy Hoffa would wind up on an episode of Decoding the Unknown. After all. Riddle is his middle name. Wait, is it really? James Riddle Hoffa was born in Brazil. Okay, yes it was. On Valentine's Day in 1913, and yes, that really is his middle name, and Brazil is a city in Indiana. Not only... Okay, dude. Really? I was like, he's born in Brazil? Cool. Interesting story. Not only is it not a surprise that we would cover his disappearance here, but it's not a surprise that Jimmy would have wound up interested in labor unions. Jimmy first entered the workforce at the age of seven after his father died from lung disease in 1920. Ah, the past. <laughs> How old are you, son? I'm seven. I'm seven years old, sir. Get in the mines! And Margaret Thatcher, get out of the mines! <laughs> not because I feel moral about it, but because... Well, I'm doing the same voice for Margaret Thatcher as I'm doing for the boy. Okay, look, let's just move on. This is this is too much. No one likes this. He was only working odd jobs to try and help feed the family, but by the age of 14, he'd drop out of school and go to work full-time doing manual labor. When he was 11, the family had also relocated to Detroit, Michigan. Not only did Jimmy begin working at an age that would now be illegal, but he was well aware of exactly what caused his father's death. His father had worked in the local coal mines, and it was terrible working conditions there that had caused him to die of lung disease. Yeah, if you work in a coal mine, you die of lung disease. That was the coal mine, wasn't it? Like It's like Jimmy's entire childhood was designed for him to become the face of labor rights. He would go on to organize his first strike in 1932. At the age of only 19, Jimmy was working in a warehouse for Kroger, a grocery store chain in the Midwest and some southern states. The way Kroger is... Have I heard of Kroger? Kevin, have you brought up Kroger's before? I feel like I even know that it's Kroger's. Like Kroger, but people do people call it Kroger's? Why do I know this? The way Kroger had structured the warehouses, the staff were essentially on call non-stop, but they only got paid when they were actually unloading trucks. They had to just wait around on the loading docks all day, not getting paid until the trucks arrived. That is capitalism while being a d Even when they were being paid, the wages were extremely low, well below what would have been the industry standard. Jimmy organized the workers to strike, choosing the most opportune moment they could. They waited until a shipment of strawberries came in that needed to be unloaded and, and put on ice before spoiling. And this is when the strike began. That is a good time to strike. Because, like, coal miners strike. It's like, well, that coal's not going anywhere, is it? Whereas the strawberries are like, those strawberries are going off very quickly. The labor may have been expendable, but the product was not. Management agreed to sit down to contract negotiations and the workers were able to get the produce on ice before it went bad. After their day, Jimmy and his fellow strikers were known as the Strawberry Boys, which doesn't really have the, like, strength of name that I'd expect, does it? The Strawberry Boys weren't members of any union, so it took a lot of courage for them to stand up together against a company that made it very clear how replaceable they were, both through their terrible treatment and by frequently replacing them. That sort of courage and leadership oft doesn't often go unnoticed, and it wasn't long before they'd caught the attention of the team's what are the Teamsters? I feel like I've heard of this. Are these like local people? Uh, local people. Union people. By 1933, Jimmy had joined the Teamsters Local 299 and he became a business agent for the 2... I'm going to call it 299 because that feels right rather than 299, 299. That sounds like how it should be said, right? As best as I can tell, a business agent is in the union was basically a middle management type role. They would work with the leaders at individual locations to ensure that their rights weren't being violated and the business agents would deal with problem resolution and arbitration. Jimmy must have been good at it because he quickly found himself rising through the ranks of the Teamsters. The year 1937 was a big one for Jimmy. That year, he was elected president of the local 299. He also met a woman when she and her fellow laundry workers were on strike, I guess, when you're a local union president there's no better to search for a calipagus calipagus that is a new word to me <laughs> vocabulary expanding but we're learning we're learning let's look up what it means i love that on this thing you can just touch it touch look up 
and it's like Kilopigus. Having well-shaped buttocks! <laughs> it's very specific. I'm not sure how often I'll be using that word, but good. My apologies, Simon. The woman he met was of Polish ancestry, so good luck pronouncing Josephine Poz... Poz... Poziwak. Josephine Poziwak. Okay. The two were married six months later, and we'd go on to have a son and daughter together. By all accounts, Jimmy was the perfect family man. He didn't smoke, he never touched alcohol or coffee his entire life. Yeah, coffee. That's the devil's drink. So many, it's like, I had three cups of coffee and beat my wife. <laughs> What's wrong with coffee? In America, you're so Puritan sometimes. It's coffee. Relax. Yeah, I, lo I love coffee. He wouldn't swear in front of, it, front of his children. Oh, God. I have to stop this. Like, my, my oldest has definitely reached the age. And I, I swear. Like, I definitely swear. And now I've had to stop. Because the other day, uh, I was, like, walking along. And it wasn't a swear word. But she's like, what the hell is that? And I'm like, um, that's a daddy word. <laughs> so I'm having to rein it in at home. He was always faithful to his wife. He also had a weekly tradition of taking his kids and their friends out for ice cream. Even his associates, high society types who enjoyed booze, gambling, and sex workers. I feel like it would be like, and his, and his friends who all had loose morals and enjoyed things like coffee and sex workers. <laughs> like, holy These are not the same. Things I had this morning, coffee. Things I didn't have this morning, sex workers. <laughs> They'd instead... They would find themselves at Jimmy's meetings at soda shops, him treating them to chocolate ice cream. The man loved ice cream even more than Joe Biden. Okay, this is a fun fact. I didn't know Joe Biden loved ice cream, but great. Who doesn't love ice cream? Ice cream's fantastic. Ice cream is kind of like the weight of my heart a little bit. In his personal life, Jimmy Hoffa was described as the cleanest living man you could ever meet. But as for his professional life, well, like I said, when he first went missing, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that he'd been murdered. So how did this clean living champion of workers' rights become just another corpse? Well, because good people get killed all the time. <laughs> it's like what? You know, like journalists who fight against corruption and stuff just get taken away in a van or like they act accidentally fall off a balcony like a clumsy oligarch. Road to the presidency. From his early years in the Teamsters, Jimmy was a unifier and a true man of the people. He sought to consolidate regional trucker organizations under the umbrella of the Teamsters. He also played a huge role in the expansion of the Teamsters. At the time, the union only represented local drivers as long-haul trucking was considered to be an entirely different industry. Jimmy disagreed and would go out to personally recruit long-haul truckers one at a time. These truckers were known to sleep in the trucks on the side of the road, so Jimmy would approach the sleeping trucker, knock on the window, and quickly deliver a pitch before ducking to avoid the oncoming tire iron. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a good way to persuade people to your cause. It's like, hey, 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 hello, are you awake? I'm not awake. What are you doing? Come on, come on. Let me tell you about unions. You'll be like, oh, f off. <laughs> I'm trying to sleep. Jesus. That's not really an exaggeration either, as a sleeping trucker would assume that anybody knocking on their window was planning to steal the cargo. Fortunately for Jimmy, he was very relatable to the working class man. To start, he grew up poor and really was working class himself. Despite being so clean around his family, he also had a mouth like a sailor, which made establishing a rapport with low-level workers much easier. I'd be brilliant at establishing rapport with low-level workers then. <laughs> Buckety buck buck. <laughs> but above all, Jimmy was both charismatic and understood the value of what they were offering. Now immortalized by Al Pacino in the movie The Irishman. Oh my god, I haven't seen that. Is that is he is Al Pacino playing Jimmy Hoffa in that? Is that what this that movie's about? I didn't even know. For some reason I assumed it was set in Ireland, which makes no sense. <laughs> Ah, uh, now that I know it's about this. I really want to see that. I, it's just, it's hard to commit to like, isn't it like four f hours long? <laughs> Even on Netflix, I'm like, it's going to take me a week to watch that easily. Something we will definitely get to later. Jimmy famously said, if you got it, a truck driver brought it to you. Don't ever forget that. That's the whole secret to what we do. This statement wouldn't be made until years later when the Teamsters were considered the most powerful organization in the country aside from the federal government. Holy but he really did understand how to galvanize his base. Membership in the Teamsters had largely stagnated. Okay, I, Kevin hasn't explained to me what Teamsters is, I assume because it's something that just everybody knows, but it just seems to be some sort of big union for truckers. Right, what well, did Kevin explain this and I just turned off? That's also an entirely possible possibility. Um, so it's a big, big union for drivers, right? Oh my god, did Kevin really say that? I think he did. <laughs> Uh-oh. I don't know, because I don't remember it. <laughs> Uh, so they had been stagnated since 1903, but Jimmy's efforts saw huge increases in a short amount of time. By 1936, only three years after he went from being a non-unionized strawberry boy to first joining the local 299, he had worked to increase membership from 75,000 to 170,000. Only three years later, there'd be over 400,000. Why is there any mystery about his death? It's like, companies hate this. They have lots of money, and uh, 
Obviously, there's plenty of psychopaths in the world. And don't... Is it like a disproportionate number of people who are psycho are definitely going to end up like in, you know, big boy positions of power, right? Because that's obviously going to help you get there. <laughs> and they'll be like, yeah, just pop him off. Just take him out back and throw him in the cement of that new stadium. Bada bing, bada boom. In the early 1940s, Jimmy formed the Michigan Conference of Teamsters. He worked tirelessly, fighting for workers' rights and bringing truckers together. And when I say he was fighting for workers' rights, I mean that quite literally back in the day. Strikes were violent affairs. Companies would bring in hired goons, usually from the mafia, to take care of strike breakers as brutally, though preferably as non-lethally as possible. If you're at all familiar with the story of Jimmy Hoffa, the idea that unions would be- Have I made a video about this guy? <laughs> this story is sounding increasingly familiar the more I'm doing it. And I realize that I have this vague knowledge of Jimmy Hoffa, not because I've made a scene a movie or something, but I feel like maybe I made a biographics video about him like years ago it's another channel i do where we do like biographies of people i feel like um i feel like maybe i have because <laughs> this is like the mafia this this story is a little bit familiar to me but just remember i don't remember any of that stuff because it is in the eyes out the mouth and it does not enter the brain at least in any meaningful way if you're at all familiar with the story of Jimmy Hoffa, the idea that the unions being roughed up by mafia goons may sound a bit confusing. It's true that Jimmy had to deal with organized crime even from his early days as a teamster, but the mafia and the teamsters weren't really aligned yet. Trucking unions were often embroiled with criminal elements, but it was hardly a partnership. The teamsters weren't nearly big or powerful enough, and Jimmy was making deals with gangsters out of necessity for the safety of shipping routes and as muscle to ensure employers kept up their end of the negotiated contracts. But when it came to attempting to break up their strikes, the Mafia were more than happy to take payment from what they perceived to be the winning side. Although he was small in stature, Jimmy fought hard on the front lines of these strikes where he received numerous injuries. This only furthered his popularity among the rank and file of the Union, combined with his incredible ability to expand the Union's influence and membership. By 1947, Jimmy found himself serving as a trustee on the General Executive Board. In 1952, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, IBT, <laughs> they call themselves Brotherhood, which always sounds scary, because there's that... Is it the, is the, is the Aryan Brotherhood? I'm always like, oh, hello. <laughs> Brotherhood sounds scary. Hey, brotherhood on three. One, two, three, brotherhood! They held a conversation in Los Angeles. Tensions were high, as the union had just elected its first new president since 1907. There were talks of an internal revolt being imminent, but Jimmy was there to come to the rescue. He was able to put down the potential uprising, and all he asked in return was for newly elected president Dave Beck to appoint him as the new vice president. That's all he wants. It's all he wants. Just make me the second most important person. That's all. That's all. I'm not vying for your job, Dave. In 1955, things started to escalate. Thanks in no small part to Jimmy's efforts, the Teamsters had grown from a union of 75,000 members to over 1.5 million. They wielded immense power and were able to negotiate a contract to control all over-the-road shipping across 25 states. This is great for the truck drivers as it ensured that they would receive uniform wages and were compensated fairly for their efforts. It was also seen as a dangerous consolidation of power. If the Teamsters Union were ever to go on strike, they could literally shut down the entire country. Remember all the supply chain issues during the COVID lockdown? It would basically be like that, except instead of people fighting over what little product was available, there'd actually be nothing. Store shelves wouldn't have been virtually empty, they would have been completely empty. Yeah, this is the problem. This is like, this is a really powerful union. Because they can just be like, yo, we're not going to deliver anything. The unions are pretty powerful. Like, ah, oh, the police definitely had something. I feel, no, ah, there was like, the police can't strike in the UK. There was something about this a few years ago. They really wanted better pay or some shit like that, or pensions or whatever. Even though I think the police get to retire super early. Like, my uncle was a, was a detective, and he, he retired really young. I think that's like one of the perks. So that sounds pretty nice, but I, I don't think the police are allowed to strike. It's like criminal for them to strike because they're like needed or something. By this point, the Teamsters had also formed a strong relationship with the Mafia. Originally, they'd hired mobsters to ensure the companies honored their contracts. Then it was to gently eliminate the competition by getting all the other unions and non-union truckers to join the Teamsters. Now it was a full-on partnership, with many mobsters serving as officers within the union. Wait a minute, didn't we just say earlier that the Mafia was with the companies? That year, the Teamsters also moved their headquarters from Indianapolis to Washington. Washington, D.C., with Jimmy speak spending increasing amounts of time in D.C. instead of with his family in Detroit. He also decided that despite having helped Dave Beck's peaceful transfer of power, thus earning himself the vice presidency, that wasn't good enough. What a surprise! There was going to be a new election in 1957, and he wanted to take over. Who could have seen this coming? To help bolster the odds of winning, Jimmy conspired with Mafia member Johnny Dio to create 14 new chapters in New York known as Paper Locals. These were Teamster chapters that only existed on paper and had no members. The chapters 
Manzoni had officers, all of whom were members of the Mafia. Jimmy was essentially giving the Mafia a free license for extortion under the guise of Teamster operations. And in return, he would receive support from the delegates of those chapters for his presidential run. This seems enormously corrupt. <laughs> like, this doesn't seem like Jimmy Hoffer, he's the champion of the people and all of this stuff. And he's also like, dude, this is super corrupt. <laughs> Are you really the person we want? Like, I feel like defending workers' rights should be the opposite of corruption and sh. I mean, I, know that, I realize that sounds like a crazy statement with all the history of unions and stuff, but <laughs> I feel like that should be in, in like the general like consensus, right? Those should be the good guys, I feel. Like, the unions are probably the good guys for the everyday man on the street rather than like, you know, Jeff Bezos' side. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Maybe you're the bad guy pretending to be the good guy. I know it's weird in America because there's such a love for like the American dream and like one thing that always struck me as quite bizarre is that people vote against their own financial interests like they'll be like yeah no there should be tax breaks for the rich it's like but you're poor it's like yeah but I'll be rich one day <laughs> it's like okay what are you up to just vote how you vote like what's appropriate for that moment in your life like change your mind later that's okay when these paper locals applied for charters from the IBT Jimmy's political opponents were outraged it was a clear power grab and an attempt to steal the presidency from Beck it created a huge amount of turmoil and fighting within the organization. For Beck, it was a little too much. For Jimmy, it was the perfect amount. Their infighting over the charter applications for the paper locals caught the attention of the Department of Justice and the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. <laughs> that is a very long title for a something. <laughs> They transferred the case to the Labor and Public Welfare Committee chaired by then-Senator John F. Kennedy. Beck argued that their jurisdiction only pertained to racketeering and they had no business investigating any of this. Senator John McClellan disagreed, but he was also concerned that JFK was too close with union leaders and wouldn't investigate them properly. This led to the creation of the Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management. Oh my god, government, could you come up with more long names? Also known as the McClellan Committee. The committee was chaired by Bobby Kennedy, who immediate that's Kennedy, JFK's brother, right? He was was he also assassinated? I feel like yes. Was that another Kennedy? There's a lot of Kennedys. It gets confusing. He immediately subpoenaed Beck to appear before the committee for questioning. Beck fled the country for a month to avoid the subpoena. Not suspicious at all, but eventually returned so that he could plead the fifth a total of 117 times. None of that was enough to save him. Bro, if you're fle if you're fleeing the country. I don't feel like that's something that you could then, you know, go back to. You'd be like, nah, nah, I did flee the country. That doesn't look good. If you flee the country, it's kind of like, that's a one-way trip, my friend. <laughs> Or it should be, because I get the feeling it's uh, about to end badly for you. Evidence was produced to reveal that Beck had given himself hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest-free loans from the Teamsters funds. Loans that were never paid back. Uh-oh! He eventually confessed and was indicted on charges of tax evasion, and since he was behind bars for the 1957 IBT convention, the election for president was an easy win for Jimmy. Wow, he really- this is- there's so much corruption. It's like, the corrupt guy's trying to overthrow the other guy. Who, I don't know who's more corrupt. One guy was stealing money. The other guy's like working with a mafia to like get elected secretly. It's like, goddamn. I mean, at the beginning of this, I was like, yeah, unions, you know, they, 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 they do the stuff of work. There's no wonder people think they're corrupt because it seems like they're mega corrupt. There was still the small matter of Bobby Kennedy. I mentioned there had been concerns that JFK would have gone easy on the unions, and there were some who felt that Bobby would have been heavily influenced by his big brother to take it easy on them as well. The skeptics could not be more wrong. Bobby Kennedy had a raging hard-on for justice, and the only way to get rid of it would be to completely f*** the Teamsters. <laughs> That's an interesting sentence. The President, the Mafia, and Bobby Kennedy. Jimmy's tenure as the president of the Teamsters was complicated at best and marred by controversy. What a surprise! The guy who got there by being super corrupt and overthrowing the other super corrupt guy had a controversial reign as president. Shocking. Shocking. As soon as he was elected president, he was already under, under investigation by Kennedy. Johnny Dio, the mobster that had helped create the paper locals, was brought before the select committee. Audio from wiretapped phone calls between Dio and Jimmy was played, in which it seemed they were discussing creating more fake chapters. Dio pled the fifth a total of 140 times because the mafia pleads the fifth. Despite the blatant corruption and ties to organized crime, Kennedy's investigation into the Teamsters drew a lot of heat from the public. In a sentence that's hard to imagine writing, liberals absolutely hated Kennedy. They saw him as being rude, insolent, and vicious, constantly badgering witnesses. He was also easily provoked by Jimmy and his cohorts, and Kennedy would frequently lose his temper and, and just start shouting insults at them. The interrogations also resulted in the famous picture of Hoffa throwing his middle finger up at Kennedy in front of the Senate committee while being asked to give testimony. Yeah, it doesn't help. Like, don't antagonize. You're supposed to be, like, the big, big, like, the, the high road, Kennedy. Come on. 
Since Bear admitted to at least some of his crimes, and Jimmy was arrested after being allegedly caught trying to bribe an aide to the select committee, the public outrage against Kennedy probably needs a bit of context. I also say that Jimmy allegedly tried to bribe an aide because he was actually acquitted on those charges. Well, then it's not alleged, he just, I mean, it was alleged, but then it wasn't. He didn't do it. <laughs> Apparently. Anyway, this was only a few years after McCarthy led the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations in an anti-communist witch hunt in which over 650 people were brought to testify in a span of less than two years. That's nearly one suspected communist every single day. And we all know Congress doesn't work anywhere close to 365 days a year. Both these investigations and the Army McCarthy hearings had already happened and McCarthy had fallen well out of favor with the public. And rightly so. That was some crazy that was going on back in the day, America. Especially since the select committee had been birthed from the PSI, it would be easy for people to see Kennedy's intolerant crusade against suspected criminals as being no different than that of McCarthy's persecution of suspected communists. Yeah, except one was about, like, I feel these are really different. One's like pursuing people who are obviously corrupt, and the other's about pursuing people who... It was so much worse than just them being communists. It was like... Wasn't McCarthyism all about... Was that also the gays in the military thing? And gays in the... In the government and all that shit? Where he was like, Yeah, well, you could be uh, turned over. You could, like, they could use it to blackmail you against the government. And shit like that. It's like, well, whose fault is that? <laughs> is it the fault of the person who's gay? Or is it the fault of the fact that being gay is not allowed? <laughs> Come on, McCarthy. Use your big brain. Bobby Kennedy would continue to relentlessly pursue the Teamsters until he took a little break in 1959 to help his big brother run for president. When Jimmy wasn't busy flipping off Kennedy, he had a union of 1.5 million people to run. That is a lot of people. Like I said, his presidency was complicated. Although he was now deeply associated with the Mafia, he still mostly put the needs of his workers first. After the childhood he had had, it's unlikely that he would have become completely disconnected from the common man. Though he took counsel from the Mafia, he would not take orders from them. He was also mostly an advocate for civil rights and all of his public statements were against racism, and he implemented strict anti-segregationist policies for the Teamster chapters. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of good stuff about this Hoffa fella. He's just, uh, seems to also be mega corrupt. On the other hand, his own local 299 was accused of discrimination. Jimmy also told Martin Luther King Jr. when they met in person that while he supported the cause, the March on Washington was essentially pointless and wouldn't accomplish anything. Um, I don't know what the March on Washington was, but... That, I don't, okay, so maybe that was something that's super good. But I also just w would say that you can believe in someone's cause and also think they go about it in a terrible way. There's loads of examples of that where it's like, yeah, no, I definitely believe that what you're fighting for is right. But is that really the right way to go about things? Like terrorism often comes to mind. It's like, really? That's what you want to do? That's what you want to get the message across? Mm. Like, I believe in the message, but terrorism is too far. <laughs> By no means do either of these things mean he was secretly a segregationist, and I couldn't find any reports of him making racist remarks in private, but the optics of both of those things still aren't great. Okay, I guess the wash march on Washington was something that everybody loves. I, d I just don't know what it is, I'm sorry. It's unquestionable that Jimmy's influence was huge for the labor rights movements and that countless people benefited from his work. In 1964, he was famously quoted as saying, While working men and women have long known the value of a dollar, it is a lesson well taught to one who labors for a living. It has taken a long, long time to teach employers the value of a human being, and in many cases it has not yet been successfully taught. Yeah, when was this? The 1960s? I don't even think it's been successfully taught today, to be honest. A congressman also said of him that Jimmy Hoffa has put more bread and butter on the tables for American kids than all his detractors put together. Full disclosure, it's worth noting now that this quote came from a Democratic congressman, and the Teamsters were known for pumping money into the campaigns of Dems and exerting political influence over corrupt elected officials. Still, the point remains valid. Um, the point remains debatable, Kevin, because obviously he's not directly paying them. They're getting directly paid from the companies. Sure, he's maybe negotiated them higher wages and stuff like that, but they're still the ones paying them. And this is like something that's good, like that the free market exists and it allows people to get paid through private enterprise and the free market. Like, all controversial, but it's like... That's I, I don't think capitalism is perfect by any means. I just think it's probably better than the other options. I mean, th uh, like, while not being a d like, I don't think communism works particularly well. Socialism works fine. Um, but obviously there's lots of capitalism and socialism in socialist countries. Uh, still, the point remains valid, and there were a lot of American families whose lives were greatly improved by the tireless efforts of Jimmy. But of all the families whose lives were improved, none improved more than a select group of families of Italian descent the Mafia. 
Back in 1955, when Jimmy was only the vice president of the Teamsters, he created the Central States Pension Fund. It was a $2.2 billion fund that was allegedly to service the pensions of the Teamsters, and that amount is roughly $24 billion today. Instead of investing in stocks and bonds like this sort of fund normally would, it was instead invested in Florida and California real estate. Okay, that seems a mistake. Like, <laughs> I don't know much about finance, but I do know diversify portfolio is a good thing. You don't want all of your eggs in one basket. You know, property, stocks and shares, bonds, all that other sh Like, it's good to have diversity. And if you're investing that vast amount of money that everyone's relying on as a pension in just real estate, in just two states, that seems very risky. More importantly, it was a giant slush fund that Jimmy could use to buy friends and influence, and he used it to make massive loans to the Mafia to fund their operations in Las Vegas. That is not a good... This is not good. <laughs> I mean, okay. And if you find some old-timers on your next trip to Vegas, they will almost definitely tell you that the casinos were better back when they were run by the Mafia. But the quality of the gambling experience aside, that is all definitely illegal, and a fraudulent use of a pension fund. Yeah, no sh**. <laughs> It seems that for both Jimmy and the Mafia, the good times were going to keep on rolling, but Bobby Kennedy hadn't forgotten about them. After JFK was inaugurated as president in 1961, he appointed Bobby Attorney General. This gave him unprecedented authority to try and convict Jimmy by any means necessary, including creating a group of investigators and prosecutors known as the Get Hoffa Squad. The animosity between the two escalated to the point that Jimmy referred to it as a blood feud, which had even included at least one very minor physical altercation. Jimmy hated Kennedy because he saw him as a posh, overprivileged twat. Honestly, that sounds like a pretty fair assessment of the Kennedys. Kennedy hated Jimmy because he saw him as a brash loudmouth and a corrupt thug. Also, a totally fair assessment. So I guess, at least, they hated each other for the right reasons. No, they didn't. They hated each other for the wrong reasons. People should be able to look past their backgrounds. But this is a terrible reason to hate someone else just because, like, you're like, oh, he's a bit posh. And you're like, oh, he's a bit rough. You should be able to leave those things totally behind if you want to, like, you could... Uh, that seems like a very strange thing to uh, hate each other for. Jimmy was re-elected as president of the Teamsters in 1961, but in 1962 changes were brought before a grand jury to decide if he should face trial for conspiracy. For anyone unfamiliar, a grand jury happens good, okay, <laughs> before the actual trial. Basically, the prosecution presents some of their evidence and the grand jury decides whether or not they have another case to bother going to trial. It sounds like it should be the other way around. Like, wait, the grand jury decides whether something should go to trial? I feel like there should be the jury and then it's like, I don't know, if you appeal or something like that, then you get the grand jury. And maybe they wear, like, fancy clothes. The grand jury isn't trying to ascertain the guilt or innocence of anyone, just if there's enough probable cause to justify a trial. This is an extremely low bar to clear, and the most recent numbers I can find, which are from 2010, show that grand juries vote for indictment in 99.9932% of cases. In that case, the grand jury is pointless. Just be like, if you consider a grand jury, just be like, cool, we don't need to waste these people's time. Just be like, if that was considered, it's going through. Boom. Also, yeah. Why? Also, it does seem like he's very, like, you don't want to say he's guilty, because obviously that needs to be proven in a court of law. Maybe that'll happen. But it definitely seems like he has done some naughty <laughs> If you're wondering how Jimmy's grand jury trial went, well, let's just say that in 1963 he was arrested and charged with bribing a grand jury. The arrest of such a famous and powerful person, especially one with considerable criminal ties, was obviously a big deal. It was such a big deal that there were many who believed that the Mafia retaliated against JFK a few months later in Dallas as punishment for giving his little brother the authority to try and take down the Teamsters. Oh my god, there's a conspiracy. Of course, that would be a whole topic for a different episode. Well, they'd just kill Bobby, wouldn't they? Why do they need to kill the president? That's going to be, I mean, just kill the main guy rather than the guy who's much more difficult to kill, apparently. This time, Jimmy, well, was they maybe did? Bobby Kennedy was assassinated as well, right, wasn't he? Was that, was Bobby Kennedy the one who was assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan? Sirhan Sirhan? Right? In that hotel? I feel like I made a video about this as well. That is correct. Of course, that would be a whole topic for a different episode. This time, Jimmy could not buy his way out of the conviction. On March 4, 1964, Jimmy was sentenced to eight years and to $10,000 on the count of jury tampering. A couple of months later, another trial was held, which he was convicted of conspiracy in, as well as mail and wire fraud, and all that illegal stuff with a pension fund. For these crimes, another five years were tacked onto his sentence. Holy <laughs> he got eight years for trying to bribe. Okay, maybe bribing the jury is more serious. 
yeah, that does. Like, on retrospect, that does seem more serious. But he got five years. He was messing around with $24 billion. Five years. And that was like, but plus conspiracy, plus mail and wire fraud, plus the pension fund. Five years sounds super low. Jimmy and his team have nearly a hundred lawyers. Good lord fought to appeal all of the charges, uh, which all failed. Despite his rather severe legal troubles, he was still popular enough to win his re-election as president of the Teamsters again in 1967. Isn't he in jail for like eight plus five years? No? Okay, he's just running it from prison. <laughs> Criminal or not, he was doing a damn good job of being a labor leader. Once all the appeals were unsuccessfully used up, Jimmy would finally begin his sentence in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania on March the 7th, 1967. Oh, you're not in prison while you appeal. I didn't know that. Oh, because America has the bail system, right? He bailed himself out probably with some of that money, allegedly. Ha oh, Fall from grace. Upon entering prison, Jimmy was immediately upset when he realized he wasn't being given special treatment above the other inmates. He's like, where's my private cell? Where's my butler? Can you imagine being convicted of multiple felonies only to be sent to prison where you were treated like a common criminal? Actually, considering how rich and powerful he had become, it is difficult to imagine that happening in America. I don't know, man. Like, Bernie, it's always like Bernie Madoff went to prison forever. And he was messing around with billions. I think rich people do go, I mean, okay, obviously less, because they're really good lawyers. And I guess it's mostly for, like, white-collar sh**, like Bernie Madoff. But, okay, yeah, I'm not going to continue this argument, because obviously less rich people go to prison. <laughs> As a fun little bonus fact, his lack of special treatment actually proved quite beneficial. Between the forced exercise and the fact that the food at the prison was incre inedible garbage, Jimmy wound up losing a decent amount of weight between bars. This is believed to have saved him from developing type 2 diabetes, so at least he's got that going for him. Though he would remain president at the Teamsters, Jimmy appointed his associate Frank Fitzsimmons as acting president. Frank was a Detroit resident, Hoffa loyalist, and fellow longtime member of the local 299. He seemed like the perfect puppet for Jimmy to control from behind bars. However, Jimmy and Frank weren't really cut from the same cloth. Frank was much more agreeable as a person instead of being a big fat loudmouth. Seeing as it was put in place as Jimmy's puppet, it's no surprise that Frank was much more malleable as an individual. The Mafia quite liked this as Frank was willing to take orders from them when Jimmy would merely take advice. Yeah, can you imagine being like not a super strong like, I'm Jimmy Hoffer and you do what I say. And it's like, I'm Jimmy Hoffer's puppet. Oh, hello, Mafia. We're going to need you to do this. Okay. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't break my legs. I pretty promise. Please be gentle. In the 1968 presidential election, the Teamsters backed Richard Nixon's candidacy. This was a big break from the union's tradition of supporting Democratic candidates around the country, and it resulted in Frank and Nixon becoming friends. Nixon also noticed how amenable Frank was. It's always nice to have friends with deep pockets who are in control of over two million voters. Now, I'm not going to pretend that Jimmy wasn't corrupt as lining his own pockets, but he still made sure that the union workers got the treatment and wages that they deserved. Frank was more interested in looking out for number one than being a zealous advocate for the working man, which meant that he was exactly the sort of man that both the Mafia and Nixon would have preferred as the official president of the Teamsters, rather than just acting president. Luckily, there was another union election coming up in 1972. But could Frank really beat Jimmy? Jimmy, even behind bars, was far more popular among the union than Frank could ever hope to be. It was best not to take the risk. Jimmy had to be removed from the equation, and allegedly the Mafia was able to get it done for the low price of a million dollars, allegedly payable to Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. Nixon, Frank, and the Mafia worked together to strike up a deal which would then be offered to Jimmy. All Jimmy had to do was sign a document resigning as president of the Teamsters and Nixon's would Nixon would commute his sentence to time served. Frank would be upgraded from acting president of the Teamsters to official president, but he'd still be up for re-election in 1972. Wait, are we talking about Jimmy Hoffa being popped off by the Mafia, or is he getting the million dollars? What's going on? For Jimmy, this seemed like a pretty sweet deal. He got out of prison, and all he had to do was win the Teamsters election the following year so that he could get back on top. Having spent so long working alongside organized crime, he probably assumed that they'd had his back, and that they'd been able to somehow bribe extort or otherwise convince Nixon to let him out of prison. Given how powerful both Jimmy and his close friends and associates were, it's not even an unreasonable assumption for him to make. Yeah, totally. He'd be like, you got my sentence commuted. How did he do that? Who did you bribe? Because of course that's how your world works. The fact that the resignation came complete with a $1.75 million lump sum severance package in the 1970s. That is a lot of money today. And it's a lot of money back in the day, but that's that's got to be what? 10 mil? Easy. 
That should have been the first clue that something was up. That's nearly $13 million today. Exactly. God damn. And it was an unheard of pension amount from the IBT. More importantly, the commutation from Nixon barred Jimmy from engaging in the direct or indirect management of any labor organization until March the 6th, 1980. A caveat that he was completely unaware of. Wait, didn't... Oh, okay, because he's like, do you want... Well, he would have... He didn't read the commutation papers? Because surely you've got to agree to have... Oh, well, no, I guess he could be like, I'm commuting your sentence and I'm barring you from this. It's not something you have to sign or agree to. I'm the f***ing president. <laughs> this is how it is. After serving less than five years of his 13-year sentence, Jimmy was released from prison on December the 23rd, 1971, just in time to make it home to his family for Christmas. He appeared on TV being interviewed by reporters as soon as he was released, and he was asked whether he would return to his union activities or if there were any legal restrictions that would prevent him from doing so. His very sincere response was that he wanted to, but he wouldn't know until he got back to Detroit and spoke with his parole officer about what restrictions existed, if any. Okay, yeah, there you go. It's not like he had to agree to it. It wasn't like a contract. It was just like, this is what I'm doing. That's the rules, Jimmy. You have to live by them because I'm President Nixon, baby. Remember, Nixon didn't pardon him, as is often reported. He merely commuted the sentence, so Jimmy was still a convicted felon and had to deal with the parole officer. Anyway, a few hours after giving the previous answer to reporters, he found out the truth, and he was pissed. But Jimmy was a fighter, and he wasn't going to let something as small as a legal mandate from the President of the United States stop him from achieving his dreams. Well, Jimmy, if he's commuted your sentence, can't he undo that commutation that he's not pardoned you? So surely you can just be like, nah, you go back. He's got a parole officer. He violates that. He violates his parole, right? He just goes back to prison. This is going to be very hard for you to get out of, Jimmy. For the time being, he was unable to run in 1972, and Frank was re-elected as president of the Teamsters. Meanwhile, Jimmy was doing everything he could to try and gain support to try and free himself from the legal shackles that Nixon had imposed. In 1973, he sued the government to have the restriction invalidated. Jimmy claims that he never agreed to that condition, and he was being deprived of his rights. Jimmy, they let you out of prison after five years. They let you out eight years early, mate. And you were, like, dabbling around with, like, billions of dollars in corrupt money and all of this shit. You should just be like, I'm very grateful you let me out. And I'm going to take my 13 million modern day dollars and I don't know, move to the Bahamas or some shit, Jimmy. Just go sip cocktails on the beach. I love the beach. <laughs> you, it's okay. 13 million is enough, Jimmy. It's enough. <laughs> Whatever's going on here, stop it immediately. The timing was perfect, as his lawsuit took place at the same time as the Watergate hearings. Nixon was losing popularity fast, <laughs> yeah, because of Watergate. And everything his White House had done was open to scrutiny. And unfortunately for Jimmy, the only part of this order from Nixon that could be seen as suspicious is that he commuted the sentence at all, not that it imposed the restriction against Jimmy be becoming involved in unions again. The court ultimately decided that, seeing as all of Jimmy's crimes were the direct result of him being a Teamster official, that Nixon was well within his authority to place the restriction on him. Yeah, it seems very sensible from Nixon. It'd be like, wait, so you're in prison because of all this corrupt you did in this job. How about I'll let you out of prison, but you can't do that job anymore? Super reasonable move. Super fair. <laughs> It was a crushing blow, but at least Jimmy got to smile a few months later when President Nixon was forced to resign in disgrace. Even though the courts had spoken, Jimmy was not ready to give up. At this point, he really should have, though. He had improved the lives of millions of working-class citizens, lined his pockets while doing so, and gotten away with only serving a third of his sentence. Yes! Go to the Bahamas, Jimmy, or wherever you like, and just get some, get some cocktails. Chill out, bro. Everybody just chill out! He was then given the modern equivalent of $13 million to go f off into the sunset. Especially since he was already in his 60s, he really should have just taken the opportunity to retire and spend more time with his family. $13 million buys an awful lot of trips to the soda shop for ice cream. Yes, bro! <laughs> Can't you just, can't you just take that and run? Instead, despite his severe drop in popularity amongst the Teamsters, Jimmy was planning a comeback. He was going to start with the local 299, the one place where he still remained popular and had some amount of influence. His original popularity came from his dedication and efficacy as a leader, so he could have spent the next five years working hard, earning back his former position once the deadline on his restriction was lifted. It was already 1975, so he's basically halfway through his moratorium anyway. What are you doing? You're just going to be like an old man doing this. What's the point? And I get it. Like, if someone was like, Simon, we'll give you a ton of money, but you can never, like, make videos or do, like, content, YouTube, this stuff again. I'd be like, no, because then I'm just going to be bored. Like, I'm just going to have tons of money, and it's like, I'm young. I still want to have, like, do this, you know? Come on, let's go. And, but then if they were also like, okay, Simon, you're actually now old, so you're kind of at retirement age anyway. And also, we're going to make it illegal for you to make videos. Then I'd be like, okay. <laughs> Let's go to the Bahamas. 
<laughs> like, why, Jimmy? Why? Why? Why would you do that? What, 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 what is the matter with you people? Come on. Like, I'm a motivated person who likes doing what I do. But come on, it's not necessary. At some point, you just gotta chill, bro. Why couldn't Jimmy Hopper just be more chill? And now he's gonna end up in like a cement coffin uh, underneath some stadium or some. I totally forgot about that as well. That's how it ends up. He dies. He's like, or he disappears or whatever. And it's not to the Bahamas, it's to a grave. But after so long at the top, spending five more years at the bottom would feel like an eternity, and it wasn't one that Jimmy was prepared to endure. It, instead, he had a plan to get the restriction lifted and take down his political opponents. At least he allegedly had a plan. There isn't any proof, but the theory seems to be widely accepted. So, what was his plan? Jimmy was going to spill the tea. All of the tea. He was going to make the Boston Tea Party look like, I don't know, just a regular tea party, I guess. Jimmy had wanted to separate the Teamsters from the Mafia anyway, so it was believed that he was going to rat out all of his former criminal associates. Jimmy, this is going to get you killed, dude. It's also believed that a hit was placed on him by order of Russell Buffalino, the Silent Don or the of the Philadelphia Mafia, or by Fat Tony Salerno from New York's Genovese crime family. Had the Simpsons been on TV back in the 1970s, I'm sure Fat Tony D'Amico would have ordered a hit on Jimmy since the show is so well known for predicting the future. Believe it or not, this has all been the extremely abridged version of Jimmy's life before his disappearance. Oh yeah, we're supposed to be talking about his disappearance. This show is called Decoding the Unknown, and I've just completely wrapped up for the last bloody hour in this dude's crazy fascinating life. I could go on for hours because this is a really complex and interesting story, but seeing as this is decoding the unknown not the casual criminalist, how about we get to the damn mystery already? Yeah, I, got, I hope you guys like that hour. I enjoyed the out of it, I have to say. Lisa, I enjoyed that. The Disappearance and Investigation on July the 30th, 1975, Jimmy was set to have a meeting with Mafia members Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano and Anthony Tony Jack Giacalone. Tony Jack had a younger brother, Vito, and Jimmy had met with the Giacalones for dinner a few days prior. At that dinner, they informed Jimmy of the meeting that would be taking place this day. The purpose of the 30th of the July meeting was purportedly to bury the hatchet between Jimmy and Tony Pro. The two had been close friends, and Tony Pro had even been Jimmy's vice president during one of his terms as team to president. But while both men were incarcerated at the same time in prison, something happened. Whatever it was caused a feud to develop between the two former friends, a feud that had escalated significantly. Not only was Tony Pro refusing to back Jimmy's attempts to regain power, he had reportedly threatened to either rip out Jimmy's guts or kidnap his grandchildren. <laughs> oh my god. Dude. <laughs> Don't mess with the mafia. I wouldn't expect the Mafia to make empty threats anyway, but it's worth noting that at least two of Tony Pro's political opponents within the Teamsters have been murdered. <laughs> Tony Pro, he's got the goods! If he says he's gonna kidnap your grandchildren, he's gonna do it, Jimmy! I assume the logic was that Tony Pro may be a cold-blooded killer, but who else were the Teamsters going to vote for? the corpse. It's also worth noting that Jimmy's son, James, thought the meeting was just a pretext to set up a hit. James saw that his father became more and more nervous each time the Gia Cologne brothers came by. He also understood that the Mafia didn't want his father back in power, and the more Jimmy pushed, the more concerned James was that they were going to whack him. Despite this, Jimmy left his house at 1.15pm to attend the 2pm meeting. He stopped at the office of Louis Lintow, a, a former Teamster local president who now owned his own limo company. The two had once been enemies, but they became friends over the years, and Louis was now his appointment keeper. Louis was even the one who had arranged the dinner meeting with the Gia Cologne brothers. He was out to lunch, but Jimmy spoke with some of the staff and left a message for him before heading to his lunch meeting. Jimmy impatiently waited at the Marcus Red Fox for Tony Pro and Tony Jack to arrive. If there was one thing he liked even more than ice cream, it was punctuality. Jimmy couldn't stand when anyone wasn't on time and he had to be kept waiting. I also hate this. I also hate this. It's like 7.30, we'll meet for dinner. And then someone's just like 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late. It's like, bro, what are we doing? Why do I have to show up on time? It's rude. It's so rude. It bothers the shit out of me. At around 2.15, he called his wife from a nearby payphone. Annoyed, he told her that he'd been stood up and he'd be home by 4 p.m. to grill some steaks for dinner. That sounds good. Maybe I'll have steak tonight. Nice big breakfast steak. There are several eyewitness accounts from people who saw Jimmy pacing back and forth in the parking lot, and a couple of people recognized him and came to shake his hand and chat briefly. At some point, he called Lewis and complained about being stood up. Lewis said it took place at 3.30, but the FBI believes it was earlier, based on the timing of the other phone calls from Lewis's office. Regardless of what time the call was, he wouldn't make it home at 4 to start grilling. 
The last person to claim they saw Jimmy alive was, rather fittingly, a truck driver. He said he saw Jimmy in the back seat of a Mercury Marquis driving away with three other men. The trucker didn't get a good look at the other people, which isn't too surprising, even if the other men were actually high-level mobsters. To the average person, there'd just be some random jabronis. What's a jabronis? Second word I'm looking up today. Jabronis. A foolish or contemptible person. Is it pronounced jabroni? Did I just see that? Jabroni. Jabroni. Compared to Jimmy Hoffa and his nationwide celebrity status. When he didn't arrive home, Jimmy's wife called the police to report him missing. The next morning, at around 7.20 a.m., Lewis O went to the Maccas Red Fox and found Jimmy's car parked there unlocked. He called the police, though there didn't seem to be anything in the car that would provide any sort of lead. There was very little to go on, and it didn't help that the FBI didn't bother to shut for several days. The powers that be within the FBI weren't interested in investigating this sort of crime and felt that their resources were better served elsewhere. They did eventually show up, and they've been on the case for the last 47 years. But it wasn't until nine days after Jimmy disappeared that they finally arrived with a search warrant for the unlocked car that was just sitting there. Do they need a search warrant to search an unlocked car? <laughs> I feel like in the movies, they're always like, it's unlocked. I think we should look in there. Inside the car, under one of the seats, they found an empty bottle of 7-Up. They searched it for fingerprints and found prints belonging to Charles Chucky O'Brien. By itself, this wouldn't have been a very big deal. Chucky and Jimmy were close to the point that Chucky was referred to as his foster son. They had once been that close at least, but their relationship seemed to have deteriorated as Jimmy tried to regain control of the Teamsters, even if they weren't as close as they had once been. The idea that Chucky could have been in Jimmy's car wasn't suspicious in itself. It becomes quite suspicious because of the other piece of evidence that the FBI had. The Mercury Marquis. Car perfectly matching the description of the one seen, seen leaving the Marcus Red Fox with Jimmy in the back seat belonged to Tony Jack's son. The day of the disappearance, it had been borrowed by Chucky. If Jimmy really was in the car, that makes a lot of sense. He had been growing increasingly nervous, and he wouldn't have gotten in the car unless there was someone he trusted. Someone like his so-called foster son. But that's it. And it's not a lot, is it? It's not a great <laughs> anyway, like, This is pretty flimsy. That's the only evidence that the FBI had. If a random trucker hadn't happened to see Jimmy in the car, there would be no evidence. This is the difference between the overenthusiastic amateurs we cover on The Casual Criminalist and real professional killers. Authorities searched the Mercury and found that the back seat had been cleaned. Chucky had said that he was borrowing the car to transport 40 pounds of salmon and that the fish had leaked blood, so he had to clean it up. That definitely does not sound like a stereotypical mafia a cover story at all. Dogs were brought in that found Jimmy scent in the back of the car and in the trunk, but the scent wasn't enough to go on. Yeah, what are you gonna do? Get the dog to testify in court? It's like, I feel like the scent thing, that's gonna be useful for tracking someone down, but when it comes to court, and they're gonna be like, and then the dog was barking. The defense lawyer will be like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> what are you gonna call Sergeant Chuckles to the, to the stand? Come on. Suspicion immediately fell on the men whom Jimmy was supposed to be meeting with that day, but they denied having any involvement in the disappearance, and both denied that any such meeting was even supposed to take place. These weren't amateurs, so naturally, they had solid alibis. In one of their cases, a little too solid. Yeah, this is the thing. These guys, like, they're professionals. The reason this has been unsolved for 47 years is because he was allegedly killed by people who knew what they were f doing. Like, we cover people like Casual Criminalists, so they think they're genius killers. And they're not, because they're being featured on the Casual Criminalist. The reality is, these whoever did this isn't featured on Casual Criminalist or True Crime shows because they were never caught. Because they knew what they were doing. <laughs> Tony Pro was playing cards with friends in New Jersey at the time. That sounds like a pretty routine alibi for a criminal and not terribly suspicious. Tony Jack, on the other hand, was at the Southfield Athletic Club. It was a gym that he went to every day, so this shouldn't have been a suspicious alibi. But he made sure to make it as suspicious as possible. I was definitely 100% there. You could ask anybody. I was there and I definitely wasn't murdering someone. I mean... I mean, I was just at the, I was at the gym. While he was at the gym, Tony Jack was normally a quiet guy and kept to himself. He'd be easy to miss. On the day of Jimmy's disappearance, numerous witnesses were able to place him there because he was abnormally talkative. He wasn't just talking with friends either. Tony was talking with complete strangers, making sure pe to ask people the time frequently. <laughs> this is almost like laughing at the police. <laughs> because you're like, you're letting them know that you know without implicating yourself directly. It's like, yeah, no, I wasn't at the crime scene because many people uncharacteristically testified to me being at the gym. Weird, isn't that, police, eh? <laughs> I wonder who did murder him then because it wasn't me, I was at the gym. He knows. He knows. 
The FBI obviously took note of how many people were able to place him there with such accurate timing and how hilariously suspicious it was. But as odd as the whole situation may have been, he was definitely at the gym when Jimmy disappeared. It certainly gave the FBI reason to think that he knew something was going to happen, yet no sh but he also clearly wasn't the one that carried out the hit. By scheduling the fake meeting, he certainly would have been a he would have been able to be tried as a co-conspirator, but it's hard to press charges for conspiracy to commit murder against someone when you can't prove where or even if the alleged victim was murdered. Yeah, again, professionals. For decades, there was no real evidence to go on. All they had were anonymous tips and stories of a bunch of known mobsters, none of whom said a word until decades after the disappearance. The FBI may have had their suspicions, but everybody had alibis, and there was no evidence to tie anyone to anything. And I will say it again, professionals, pay, take notice, everyone of each on the casual criminalist. This is how it's done. <laughs> I'm a professionist. Oh, if you don't know, Casual Criminalist is a true crime podcast that I also do. I'd love it if you checked it out, um, if, if you want to. Investigators conducted extensive surveillance on the people they thought were involved and even bugged their homes and places of business. Even in their private conversations, none of the people suspected were willing to talk about Jimmy's disappearance. Maybe it's possible that they found all the bugs and knew when they were being recorded, but it's far more likely that those involved swore to just never speak about it again under any circumstances. Again, this is so smart. It's like you always get like in, on the cash criminals to be like, oh yeah, and then he told his mum. Or he told his best friend, or he got drunk and he talked to a stranger about it at a bar. And it's like, no, 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 never speak of it again. I don't care with who, where, if you are out in the forest, naked and alone, with no recording devices, in the middle of nowhere, do not talk about it. Never mention it again. Professionals. <laughs> I know these are the bad guys, but from doing a true crime show, it is interesting to see people do crime properly the next piece of evidence wouldn't come until 2001 when a single strand of hair was found in the mercury marquee that chucky had been driving that day dna testing was damn they kept the car for that long it's like 30 uh 30 something years what dna testing was done to compare the hair with a hair from jimmy's hairbrush and it came back a match but also so what these days we hear the phrase the dna was a match and immediately think that it means that the case was solved but in this case it doesn't really mean anything it proves that jimmy was in the car at some point but it doesn't prove when yeah it's just a hair in the car he was there at some point maybe or it could just be like uh dragged from like someone was with him they got a hair on their coat and boom defense attorney field day Remember, these weren't strangers or a suspected serial killer with no real connection to Jimmy. His hair being found in the car is enough to draw suspicion, but it's still weak circumstantial evidence. As I said about an hour ago, there really wasn't any suspicion about what happened to Jimmy. He almost certainly died at the hands of the Mafia, but with no body ever found and no arrests made, everyone wanted to know who killed him and where the body was. Now that we have the necessary context, it is time for us to fare just as poorly as everybody else and try to answer the questions that have been around since 1975. Theories Between the high-profile nature of the case and the fact that the Mafia was involved in the 200000 reward offered by the Hoffa family, there have been a lot of theories, speculation, and tips that went nowhere. We can't possibly cover every theory, but fortunately, a lot of them fit into broader categories so we can deal with them in sweeping strokes. This would have made more sense 40 years ago when it was proposed, but the first theory is that he's still alive. Much like the theory that Hitler is still alive in South America, this still gets touted around despite the fact that it has not aged well. Jimmy would be 103 years old now, so it's safe to assume that he's dead at this point. I know it's fun to believe in conspiracy theories, but let's be real, he died in 1975. Given everything we've learned about who he was as a person and the kind of people he associated with, I think it's fair to dismiss this one right away. Yeah, 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 he's one of those people. It's like, he seemed like a good guy. Why was he so mean in his professional life? And why did someone kill him? I don't know, because he was super corrupt. <laughs> he had dealings with the mafia. Look, all of these things are uh, just more likely to get you killed. Don't be super corrupt. Don't deal with the mafia. Don't be involved in crime in general, and you're more likely to live longer. The more involved you are in that stuff, the more likely you are to die. I don't care if you're like working with the mafia and it's all good and it's like you're just it, it's just going to increase your chances of death, isn't it? 
Another conspiratorial theory that's only slightly less crazy is that he is, or rather was, in the custody of the FBI. This doesn't make a lot of sense. He had already been convicted and sent to prison. Sure, he didn't serve his full sentence, but he was trying to get the Mafia out of the Teamsters. Why would the FBI go after him? You could argue he was in witness protection or some other form of protective custody because he decided to tell all, but this theory generally involves him being held against his will. Regardless, neither scenario makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, if he's in witness protection, that would mean he testified. Like, like, him telling the FBI all of that stuff and no one getting arrested is not much use. <laughs> He'd have to go to court and testify and all this stuff, and then he could disappear into witness protection. Which, I don't know, man. You're going up against some really powerful people. You, I feel like you've got to go to, like, witness protection in the Bahamas. Which sounds like pretty nice witness protection, to be honest. Because I really, I, I imagine the actual witness protection is like you end up in some tiny village in Ohio or some shit, and you're like, this isn't what I imagined. <laughs> Just some small house. You work in a post office or something. Just like, re and it's of course it's intentionally boring because it has to be. Because if you were like, what's your witness protection? You could choose anything. I want to be a rock star. It's like very quickly they're gonna, you know, notice. Also, I don't think witness protection is gonna fund that. Be cool if they did though. That'd be kind of cool. I don't know if I have enough money. There is a much more credible theory that involves the government, though the hit likely would have still been carried out by the mafia at the time. There was a closed door Senate tribunal investigation called the Church Committee. The Church Committee was looking into illegal activities perpetrated by U.S. intelligence agencies. What? Illegal activities by U.S. intelligence agencies? Never! It's doing the impossible. And Jimmy was set to testify before the committee a few days before he disappeared. Jimmy wouldn't have been the first witness that was killed before testifying before the Church Committee. He would have been the third in as many weeks. Oh my lord. What was it? There was a, there's a rule on casual criminalists. The casual criminalist has a lot of rules for criminals. And one of them is like, yo, if uh, you're on trial for murder and someone's testifying against you, just murder them. They can't hang you twice. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, the fact that these witnesses are being killed is like the crimes that... It, this is such a major, major crimes going on here. Whether the government was involved in planning the hit or not, there's a really good chance that the timeline for his disappearance was related to his scheduled testimony. Those within the Mafia may have felt that Jimmy was going to say everything he could in order to get his restrictions on union activity lifted, something they clearly wouldn't want. Also, um, what's he doing testifying about US intelligence agencies' illegal actions abroad? Or abroad? Or wherever? Oh, just wherever. And he was murdered by someone within one of those intelligence agencies? Holy sh**. I mean, the CIA's been up to some wild ass this would rank up there. But many in the government wouldn't have wanted Jimmy to show up to that meeting either. It's possible that Jimmy had information about the CIA working with the Mafia to assassinate Fidel Castro, which is not a conspiracy theory. That's, that's something that actually attempt they attempted. So members of the government had the Mafia take him out before he could talk. Obviously, the assassination attempt failed, and the church committee was able to expose the plot, even without any testimony that Jimmy could have provided. But this is probably the most solid motive for his murder. Yeah, the, the CIA's attempt to assassinate Castro. It's just like, <laughs> the CIA's adventures in South America. I got to do videos about I've done some, but just to cover that in detail. And now I'm going to get assassinated. Granted, Jimmy was giving the Mafia plenty of reasons to want to take him out by trying to regain power, but his attempts were barely getting off the ground. The Church Committee, as a motive, gives the answer not only to why, but also to the much more important why then. Unfortunately, it does nothing to address the who or where that we're looking for. Now, when it comes to the Mafia, they like to diversify. They weren't just involved with the Teamsters. They controlled pretty much all of the construction unions and even owned a number of their own construction companies, especially in New York. Because of this, the speculation that his body became part of the construction of many, many different places. And this is what I have heard about. I didn't realize they chopped him up and buried him in all these different, like, um, cement things. But I just imagine one day they'll just be demolishing a building and there'll be a very Jimmy Hoffa shaped hole in the foundations. I mean, like, oh. And some bones that have rotted away. One of the most popular theories is that Jimmy Hoffa is, is buried beneath either the end zone or the 50 yard line of a football stadium. I thought this. The stadium is either Giant Stadium in New Jersey or the Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan, depending on who you ask. Wait, is Michigan anywhere near New York or New Jersey? Is Michigan, Chicago? Wait, is Michigan a state? Oh my god. I don't even know. Look, I don't think they're close together, are they? Chicago, Michigan? Michigan, De Michigan, Detroit! Michigan, Detroit, right? It's in Detroit. That's far. That's like 
in the middle somewhere in the north right to most people this was just a running joke however it's not necessarily without merit either both of those football stadiums were under construction at the time of jimmy's disappearance so it's not totally unreasonable to suggest that he may have wound up there unfortunately both of these stadiums have since been demolished with no signs of jimmy's remains oh no the mythbusters even checked out giant stadium for themselves just to be sure no body these are just two of the many places that have been dug up in search of his remains digs that continue to this day oh my god does why do we care it's everyone involved in this is either dead or it's past the statue's limitations right so nothing would happen it would just be we solved this mystery and there isn't really a mystery of course he was murdered by someone who didn't like him and even on the other side what's the world ass conspiracy theory like that the cia did it would we be surprised uh no not really if the, the mafia did it would we be surprised actually no if he ran off to the bahamas and just was drinking cocktails until he died would we be surprised yes does it matter no <laughs> None of these are particularly interesting. Why do we care so much? The FBI has spent millions of dollars digging holes in search of a body to the point that they no longer will disclose how much the more recent searches have cost. Oh, God, FBI. There's the money. <laughs> You can find entire articles online just dedicated to the myriad of places that have been dug up based on tips that Jimmy's body was there. So we're not going to cover them all. One of the most one of particular interest was dug up in 2012 following a tip that the FBI deemed credible. The location was a driveway in Roseville, Michigan, about 25 miles from where Jimmy disappeared. According to the tipster, the night that Hoffa disappeared, he saw his neighbor, who was a member of the mafia, burying a body under his driveway before repaving it. If you're wondering why he waited over 35 years to call in that tip, let's see how brave you are after watching a known criminal bury a body anyway a scan of the driveway revealed an anomaly two feet beneath the driveway the media jumps all over that word the second it was reported but once the site was dug up and soil samples were taken no evidence of remains were found there are countless stories like this with the most recent one being a couple of years ago in a new jersey landfill guys 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 look these people after it happened you bugged people's houses who you suspected of doing this and they never said a word do you really think that they don't know how to get rid of a body properly? That body is gone. Stop looking for it and stop wasting everyone's money. Jesus. Another popular theory comes from Tony Pro himself, at least according to one witness. There was apparently a lot of construction going on when Jimmy disappeared because another building that was under construction at the time was General Motors Detroit headquarters, the Renaissance Center. Marvin Elkind was Jimmy's driver and also a police informant. In his book, The Weasel, A Double Life in the Mob, he recalls his... <laughs> that sounds like the sort of book that gets you very quickly murdered. He recalls an encounter with Tony Pro in 1985. He was driving Tony and some other mobsters past the Renaissance Center when Tony motioned to the building foundation and said say good morning to jimmy hoffer boys unfortunately barring some new technology we don't have any way to check this claim that doesn't involve leveling the entire building seeing as it's very much still in use i don't think gm is going to go along with this plan Ooh, i mean that's very hearsay-ish but also that'd be interesting when that gm building finally does get demolished. see now even i'm interested in it but even if he is there okay so he's there and he was murdered yeah we know this brings us to another issue, however. A lot of mobsters have said a lot of different things. Assuming Tony Pro really did say that, was he just joking? And if it wasn't a joke, was it actually true? I don't have those answers, but I can tell you that it's very possible he was both completely sincere and completely wrong. Also, didn't we talk about that with the bu They bugged the houses, no one ever said a word. Do you really think he's going to make a joke about this? As I said, a lot of mobsters have said a lot of different things. Some say, uh, and we'll be like, why would the guy make this up? Money. I love money. Look, we're talking about his book. Maybe two people who listen to this uh, podcast or watch this on YouTube will think, oh, that book does sound interesting and go and buy. You know why we're talking about it? Because of the one thing in the book, this one line that is interesting for today's story, is, you know, it's money. As I said, a lot of mobsters have said different things. Some say he was left in a car that was taken to a salvage yard and crushed. And that's how and that he's now car parts in Japan. Others say he was chopped up and fed to alligators in Florida. It's almost certainly not true, but some have said he was turned into sausages. Then there are all the various buildings that were under construction at the time that have been de definitively stated as his final resting place. And all of those assume there even is a body, and some have said he was simply cremated, and that was the end of it. The thing is, these various stories have all been told decades after the fact by people who genuinely seemed convinced they were true. They are criminals, so they could just be a 
accomplished blahs or assholes who enjoy toying with the public, but they also may have been lied to. It's speculated that the leader of whichever mafia family put the hit out on Jimmy deliberately planted a bunch of fake stories of his whereabouts. Yeah, which would be a smart and professional sort of criminal thing to do, wouldn't it? Throw off the FBI. This would be done for two reasons. The first is to confuse the issue. If you have a bunch of different mobsters all convinced that Jimmy's body is in a dozen different locations, then oh, what's the FBI going to do? Dig each and every one of them up? Well, apparently, yes. But if the rumors started circulating too soon, then depending on which one of the different stories got out, they would know exactly who was talking and thus needed to be dealt with. This theory would... That is so smart. I didn't even think about that. That is actually wicked genius. <laughs> Oh god, the Mavia stuff is so crazy, they're so good at crime. <laughs> This theory would also give a good reason why everyone suspected of being involved was so tight-lipped, even in private. They wouldn't want to disrupt or contradict any of the fake information that had been circulated. While this remains a mystery to us, yeah, oh my god, so the guy, the informant in the car, they might have just suspected him of being an informant at the time. And what's-his-face would have said, yes, yeah, say hello to Jimmy Hoffa, buried in the GM building. And then if the police are suddenly digging up the GM building or searching around there, like, in the while it's being constructed, they're going to be like, that driver's a rat. Give him his concrete shoes. <laughs> so intense. While this remains a mystery to us, there are those out there that believe the FBI already knows who did it. The rumor largely stems from the fact that the FBI said they already knew who did it. Oh, okay. More specifically, Detroit's FBI chief from 1985 to 1988, Kenneth Walton, said that he knew who did it on his way out of the door in 1989. To be clear, he was retiring from the bureau. He wasn't fired. According to Walton, he knew who did it, but the person responsible was never going to face any charges. There was still no physical evidence, so the only way to build a case would have been to get confident, confidential informants to testify. Not only could they not force someone to testify, but they didn't want to burn their sources either. Even though Walton said some of the informants and suspects were already dead, the FBI would never take action. This is just one man's statement, and it is unsubstantiated, but it certainly sounds plausible. Even if they were able to get their informants to testify, thus losing any future inside intel they would have received, this still wouldn't guarantee a conviction. With no evidence besides eyewitness testimony, all they'd have is one guy's word against the other. Which, yeah, criminal court, that is just gonna, you're gonna be destroyed. It seems like a high-risk, low-reward play, so if it is true, I couldn't blame the FBI for sitting on the information. Yep, fully agree. This is like, okay, you might know all of this stuff, but to get a conviction on that, it's like, like, we know he was killed by someone in the Mafia, but like to get a conviction on it, it's something like much harder. Besides, if the previous story is true and the Mafia had deliberately planted dozens of fake stories within their own organization, there's no guarantee that Walton even had the right one. Either way, pretty much everyone that could have been involved is dead at this point, so there theoretically wouldn't be any harm in releasing the truth now. No harm to any current confidential informants, that is. There would be some serious harm in the eyes of the public if the FBI were to suddenly announce BT dubs, we've totally known who killed Jimmy Hoffa for the last 40 years, we just decided not to tell you or do anything about it. If something like that came out, the American people would be outraged beyond belief for two or maybe even three news cycles. But if Walton was telling the truth and the FBI knows who did it, then the people theoretically do have the right to know. To that end, the Hoffa family and the Detroit Free Press made Freedom of Information Act requests to get the files related to Jimmy's case released. Unfortunately, despite the case being colder than my cold black heart, it was considered an ongoing case, and, and thus most of the information was exempt from the request. Although most of the information was exempt, the FBI still released some heavily, heavily redacted documents. And I've looked at like heavily redacted documents, you know, for videos or whatever. And it's just like pages and pages of just blacked out lines. I downloaded some, they're not not like classified or anything, but I was just looking at some property stuff like for, I was, I was looking at buying a house somewhere and then there was a development going on across the road and I wanted to know more about it. And so I went on to like the, um, the property website, the government's property website, and downloaded these forms. They were all redacted, like who was doing, who was behind the building stuff, you know, because it's like private. Or maybe someone had done an FOI uh, request on it or whatever, but it was then available for download on the website, but all the personal information was blacked out. <laughs> Except I opened it in a Acrobat, and you could just delete the, uh, the, the, the blackness, the black stripes. You could just go in there, or you couldn't delete them. You could just drag the document out from underneath them. And I'm like, great job, government. <laughs> really keeping our information private there, aren't you? I really hope that for the actual sensitive stuff, they know how to redact properly because that was kind of 
not good enough. So much was redacted that if the FBI just had said had another post note that said go f yourself, that probably would have taken longer to read than the pages and pages of blacked out documents. And we've talked a lot about theories, but there is, of course, still the elephant in the room. An elephant named I Heard You Paint Houses, the book that was later adapted into the 2019 film The Irishman, starring everyone's favorite mobsters De Niro, Pesci, and Pacino. The story claims to be the true memoir of Frank Sheeran. Frank was an enforcer that was recruited to the Teamsters by Jimmy himself and was also the alleged murderer. The title of the book is what Frank claims was the first thing that Jimmy said to him when they met, to which he replied, Yep, and I do my own carpentry too. Painting houses was mafia slang for killing people. What's the, uh, the, the, I like the phrase wet work. <laughs> it's like, what do you do? Wet work. It sounds so nice, like wet work. And apparently it means like murdering. <laughs> Let's look that up real quick. Where does that come from? It's super interesting. <laughs> Wet work. Covert assassination performed by... Oh, it's by government operatives. That makes it even cooler. It's like spies. Oh, it refers to spilling blood because you'll get wet. Oh, my God. <laughs> I feel like Wet Work would be a great channel name. Just covering, like, the CIA's misadventures or whatever. <laughs> What's the channel called? Wet Work. <laughs> Love that. A podcast wet work. It's the podcast. Sounds great. Should do that. You guys want to... Should I make that show? Let me know. So painting houses with mafia slime for killing people, painting the walls with their blood. Holy violently killing carpentry meant that they also did cleanup and the body disposal oh good frank told the story to arthur charles brandt in his deathbed over the course of a few weeks despite claiming to be responsible for a number of high-profile murders there's nothing tying frank to any of them that doesn't mean he never killed anyone and it's believed that jimmy had personally used frank to order hits frank also confessed to committing numerous war crimes during world war ii which would be a fairly weird thing to fabricate for narrative purposes <laughs> let me tell you my story I'll start with all of my war crimes. Beautiful a story. It's like, dude, why? It's like, you know, you know, if you can't, there's that, that, that quote, like, if you can't get famous, infamy will do. No, don't, don't do this. Just leave it. You had a horrible life murdering people. You don't need to just, just shut the f up and die. Why do you need to live on in infamy? The short version of the story is that Frank was one of three people in the car that Chucky was driving when Jimmy disappeared. Jimmy and Frank were dropped off at a house in the Detroit suburbs. Frank gave him two to the back of the head and the body was cremated. People bought Frank's story and in a big way. Not only was I Heard You Paint Houses a New York Times bestseller, but The Irishman, a Netflix original movie, was viewed by 26 million unique accounts in the first week and was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Holy sh**. It also reportedly lost $280 million, but that's a separate story entirely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These, like, new technology movie studios like Amazon or whatever and Netflix. These, I mean, I know they're not super new, but they're, like, new in the terms of movie studios and stuff. And they're kind of bringing finances of the tech world, which are insane, to movie studios. It's like, yeah, we made a movie and lost 280 mil. Okay, that would be a huge disaster for, like, I don't know, I want to say MGM, but aren't they now owned by Amazon, which is crazy? Um, that would be a big deal, but I feel like for tech companies, it's like, nah, 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 we got like some, we got some venture capital money, we got like our subscribers, 280 mil, it's fine, it's fine, it's definitely fine. Frank's account is currently the most popular theory with the public, largely thanks to the movie and its promotion as being the real story of what happens. Unfortunately, experts are of the opinion that it was a pile of lies with many provable inconsistencies compared to the actual events. But, why would a dying man lie about having murdered one of his closest friends? Well, same reason anyone does money he was 83 years old and dying of cancer in a nursing home in florida preparing to leave prepared to leave his family nothing suddenly this opportunity comes along where he can have someone write his memoir which will result in money and royalties that he can live to leave to his kids and grandkids and all he has to do is confess to some murders that he didn't commit if i was broke dying and was given this opportunity to provide my family i'd confess to murdering the easter bunny because who cares yeah 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 legit who gives a sh Frank isn't even the only Mafia hitman to claim to have pulled the trigger, although the other is also a known liar who claimed to have killed over a hundred people, almost none of which could be tied to him in any way. Yeah, one of these uh, prison confession people or whatever. <laughs> Wrap up. Jimmy Hoffa is remembered as one of the most important and successful champions of workers' rights in American history. 
God, this episode was long. That seems like so long ago. <laughs> so much has happened. Unfortunately, that reputation has been tarnished because of all those crimes that he definitely committed and a bunch of stuff that he allegedly did as well. Corrupt as the Teamsters may have been, he still tried his hardest to put workers' rights first for the most part. It sounds like, honestly, yeah, he did a lot of good, but he also put himself first first, right? Like, the workers were, like, second to Jimmy, if we're honest. The true story of Jimmy's disappearance and almost definitely murder will probably never be known. There was virtually no evidence to begin with, and it's been so long that nearly everybody involved has died of old age at this point. We can't even hope for a last-minute deathbed confession because we've already got one and it's almost certainly just made up as the most likely scenario, Jimmy's body has never been found because there is no body to find. Many of the FBI, as, weather, as well as other leading experts in the case, are of the opinion that the body was cremated. Unless the FBI really does know the truth and their unredacted documents are eventually released, it's unlikely that we'll ever know who the real killer was. If the FBI know, well, those documents will eventually be released because, like, in a hundred years or whatever, when it's all, like, ancient history. But... Yeah, no, who cares? <laughs> Experts who have their prime suspect, though, a hitman for the Genovese family named Salvatore Sally Bugs Bruguglio. That's right, the real murderer was some background character there was no way you would suspect, because like with any popular crime mystery, it is more important to trick the audience than it is to construct a proper narrative. Also, because they're professionals. They're not gonna find it's not they're not gonna be killed by somebody who really hates him. They're gonna be killed by a professional assassin. Because they're professionals! <laughs> Sally Bugs was a ruthless killer who is suspected of genuinely killing over 50 people for the Mafia. Not some blowhard that killed five or six and claimed it was over a hundred. He was another associate of Jimmy's and one and the one believed by many to be the true killer. If that's the case, then the story ended in 1978 when Sally Bugs was gunned down in front of a social club in Manhattan's Little Italy. It may not be the most satisfying conclusion, but what did you really expect? That Jimmy was killed by some giant hominid and dragged into Florida's Elgades? Yes, that's a real theory. That was presented to the FBI by a supposed eyewitness to the murder. Okay. But that's not what happened. Just like every other episode of Decoding the Unknown, it wasn't Bigfoot or aliens or ghosts. Jimmy just pissed off the mafia. Possibly the CIA, so some mafia hitman whacked him and made sure that his body could never be found. And that's sadly the end of it. Jimmy Hoffa's tenure with the Teamsters may have ended poorly, but the same cannot be said for his son James. Following in his father's footsteps, except without all of the crime, James was elected the 10th General President of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters in 1998. He became the second longest serving president of the Teamsters, holding office until March 2022 when he decided not to run for re-election. Rather fittingly, one of James's last acts as Teamster president was to fight for pension reform and to protect the central state pension fund so that all planned participants will receive 100% of their earned pensions. Good for you, James. And that's where we end today's episode. I don't know, I don't think it was unsatisfying because we know what happens. He was murdered by someone, a minor background character probably, and that's that. If you like this episode, please do make sure you subscribe to this channel like uh like the video if you uh enjoying this as a podcast also make sure you subscribe and a review would be most welcome five stars would be the best obviously for me and uh thanks for watching <laughs>